So to become conscious properly, you need to understand your relating function. You don't have to go through your shadow first. But if you can understand what's influenced your father and your mother psychologically, you can do the best you can then with what you've got culturally and with what you've got genetically. He was, as a child, he was weaponized against the father. And these things happen all the time. We, we, we see them very commonly, don't we? In, we do. Uh, in our clinical work. All right, and welcome back to Young to Live By, everybody. Today we've got a question from one of our IPSA students, and he says, hello, Steve, once again. Hello, Jamie. <laughs> Pauline, we're not involved <laughs> in this I, question. I just remove myself So now, we will both leave and have a cup of tea. <laughs> He says, hello Steve, I hope you're well. I was just watching your personal myth video and was very interested in the part where you talk about how parents' myths can be amplified in their children. Oh yes. I can definitely see this in myself and since watching the video and having it consciously explained, I wonder whether this could contribute to a lot of the resistance I feel towards my own mother. A lot of the things she says annoy me a fair bit and I'm wondering whether this is a classic case of me being annoyed by the projections of my own complexes that I don't like or repress that are of course present in her but amplified more strongly in myself and interacting with her simply makes me conscious of them to a greater degree. I was wondering how you might be able to go about deciphering your parents personal myth to add an extra layer of depth as to where or how your own complexes may have come from. I feel like a lot of things I internalise as my own bullshit, yet which I find hard to let go of despite maladaptations to my own instincts, could be dissolved quite quickly if it became apparent they were really nothing more than an unlived dream from my parents. Ooh. It's addressed to yourself, Steve, of oh, course. Oh, me? Okay, well, I'll stop and I'll hand over to <laughs> my compatriots. Yeah, um... It's very, very hard to be objective about your parents for all sorts of reasons. The principal one being that you emerge into consciousness within the field of their psychology and their influence. But you do have to do that if you're going to make sense of their past. So you need to know as much as possible about your family history and on the influences parentally on your parents, uh, but also the culture at the time that they were young and what impressed upon them and shaped them. Then you're going to get what Jung called the dominance. Uh, at least he called that at one point in his career, which were the effects, the zeitgeist, if you like, of the age, and has that impressed upon your parents. Uh, in Jung's case, of course, they were very, very influential on him, and, and I would argue pretty much affected the way he developed the whole of his life. And he did say that you never really become conscious until you can separate yourself from the psychology of your parents. So it is, a, it is hugely important that you're able to do that in order to individuate, if that's your goal, psychologically. So yes, um, look at what's influenced your parents, both of them. And think of it in, in these terms too, perhaps surprisingly, that your father has an anima but it's also his mother's animus which will influence the development of his anima. Mm. Um, so it's not a clear-cut path. You have to look at all of the different connections. Uh, and these are relating functions, of course, that we're talking about on Young to Live By when we talk about the anima and the animus. It's much broader than simply this reified concept of being an inner, oppositely sexed image. Um, so... It's your relating function broadly. What are the influences upon that that have come down transgenerationally from your parents and then how they've affected the shaping of your personal complexes? That, it seems to me, is the question that you're asking. Mm. What are you well, guys well, well, I'm wondering how important you think it is to do this in the process of individuation. Because uh, I've had it before where people have come to me and said, I've got these issues or whatever, and it's like, okay, let's work through your issues. But then there does seem to be an insistence sometimes, and it makes perfect sense why, to try and make sense of things. In order to get over my stuff, I must understand my, my, why my parents were this way to begin with. How important do you think that is? I think in terms of personal development, if you're a psychotherapist, particularly a depth psychotherapist or depth psychologist, that's hugely important, would you say, Paul? Yes, it is. I, I was just thinking as you're talking about the the, uh, the transgenerational aspect to it. It's a question too of how far back do you go or how far back can mm. you go? Yeah. I mean, most people can probably at least go back to the um, great grandparents in terms of maybe you know finding some information about them and and uh, getting something of a sense of the backdrop of their lives. Mm. And and you've been very heavily into uh, family history, haven't you? In yes. the past, mm. yeah. personally. Yeah. Um, and that I think gave 
gave you a great insight, particularly did, yeah. into your great grandparents. Yes, it did. And yeah. e even from a, a, a genetic, a genomic point of view, you do you do see things skip generations as well, mm. traits, characteristics coming yes. through in later generations. And yeah. I know that um, your, I think it was your your father's father, so it would yeah. be uh, your paternal grandfather. grandfather yeah. That yeah. from the accounts that are given, stories that have been yeah. passed down through the family, mm. that you're probably more like him than you are your own father yes and yeah. and, and those that kind of research i think can pay off actually in terms of understanding psychologically as well mm. how the family has has developed and uh, those traits you may have uh, inherited genetically yes. as well yourself yes it just gives you a bigger picture yeah there was More no, work no direct influence on me particularly no, certainly not from my great-grandfather no. who no. Uh, if you combine the, the, the family stories of my great grandfather with my grandfather on my father's side, you kind of get a rough outline of me probably. You do. Uh, whereas uh, with my own father, I'm very dissimilar to him pretty much mm. in most respects. Mm. So, yeah, there's, there's going to be a strong genetic component too, um, but you don't have to be the slave to your genes, do you? Oh, not no. at all, no. no. No, well, when you're saying how far back do you go, Pauline, it's yeah. like, well, you can. As long as you skip a bunch of generations, presumably you can go back as far as science allows you to True. go back. Absolutely. Go back to Homo habilis and beyond yeah, that, yeah. really, to yes. sort of track that through. I've been trying to do that recently, sort of like a fun project, the story of humanity and what that's led to. Because also, what's you know, as you said, that it's important to look at the culture and what shaped your ancestors too. Mm -hmm. People don't have to necessarily necessarily be um, you know, your your blood relatives in no. that way in order to have you know to. To be worthy of being called ancestors. That's true. In that way, um, I mean, yeah. I've I've done family history quite a lot as well, I'm trying to look for royalty and can't find it. I cannot find it. But um, going going back through the generations, um, I didn't learn a, a, a massive amount except um, it's 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 okay to be normal. Yeah. Was something I took away from that actually. Yeah. Mm. So people who live standard, humble, normal lives. And, that's, yeah. and I found pictures as well the other day of um, my six times great grandparents. Wow. These uh, farmers down in, um, I forget, somewhere in, in, in the south of England. Yes. Normal chaps hanging yeah. about, and it's like, okay, this is where you're coming from. It's a very humbling thing, mm. in a way. I like it. Mm. Yeah. So you've got the psychological trans, uh, transgenerational influence, you've got the genetic, you've got the yes. cultural, um, and that's biopsychosocial, it basically. Is, yeah. and, and then how that feeds in informationally to what would be transferred down the generations. But mm -hmm. specifically for your parents, they're the most immediate influence, yeah. whether they're biological or step parents or just influential people within a family. Yeah, complexes form through experience, principally, upon a genetic base. Uh, and they're within a, a, a social and cultural context as well so you need to look at all of those different levels but if you can understand what's influenced your father and your mother psychologically you can do the best you can then with what you've got culturally and with what you've got genetically but yeah definitely things can trans Mm. and translate down generations yeah it helps remove blame and things like that as well yeah. the anger seems seems to come out and like with um with the way parents unless they specifically abused you it's a difficult thing to say about things being people's faults because of complexes that form yeah. things like that yes. so it, it sort of it, it i wouldn't say like dehumanizes or depersonalizes the situation but allows you to be more objective about it mm. as well yes you know, like it, it, yeah. you know, my dad or my mum was only like this because their mum and their dad were like that with them. So I will break the chain, yeah. Yeah. starting with myself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's hugely important. Well, I wonder specifically if there's an issue that our friend is interested in that we should be looking at. Um, is there anything emerging from that message? Do you think, James, that we should focus on? Well, the mother came through. Right. Yeah. We can have well, it's it's his own bullshit and resistance. So he has a lot of resistance to his own mother and um, internalises his own bullshit. But um, he thinks his own bullshit might come from his parents rather than what his friends might tell him, get over your own bullshit. Okay. So he's suggesting perhaps then that it's conditioning from his mother in particular that's affecting his relating function? Yes, it, yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. So is he, I guess... Um, hanging out with friends or something they they would say why are you acting like this mm -hmm. you know as he said get over your own bullshit um but no it, it could very well be a parental complex that's caused that yeah that sounds like a standard mother complex i'm afraid as uh, we say mm. the mother of all complexes mm. yeah we, we, we do indeed I, i'm just um thinking about two 
if you kind of reverse the equation and think about to why parents relate to their children in the way that they do. I mean, we, we were having a conversation the other day. Again, I, I'm kind of focusing on, on the genetic side of things and so much as when you choose to have children, if in fact you do choose to have children, um, you it's a lottery. You mm. really don't know who... You know, as things get sort of uh, shook up in the gene pool, you, you don't know what your children are going to be like. And sometimes um, they, e even in terms of their, their physical appearance, they might look more like one partner than the other, or mm. they might look like a blend, or they might look like, I don't know, um, say, uh, somebody's brother who you don't particularly like. The, there are all of these potential combinations. Yeah. Yeah. and. Parents react psychologically to those things as well, yeah. very, yeah. very strongly. And it, it's a bit unpalatable, really, to have to talk about some of these issues, which is probably why we don't. Mm -hmm. But I can think, for example, of people, say, in my family that had my children resembled those people. It might have shaped, sadly to say it, my attitude towards them growing up. Mm -hmm. And that's from a perspective of someone who's trying to... Um, tread an individuation path and to, to try and be reflexive and analytical of, of, of themselves. So for someone who is not choosing yeah. to do that, you, you could see how they would fall foul of some of those attitudes and, and, and some of those beliefs. So um, it, it just, just a way of broadening things out and looking mm. at things in a more complete way too, when you actually come to look at why your parents might relate to you in the way that they do. There might be yeah. other factors at play as well, such as, like I say, the, the, the genetic element, because yeah. you, don't, you don't choose the children that you get, you get the children you get as yeah. well, to yeah. be fair to parents. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's a hard thing. That, it isn't is. It? Because, it's not a uh, nice thing really to talk about. No, it's, it, regards, it's not from a therapeutic point of yes. view. You you could end up in self blame or reinforcing self blame yes. for mm. why you've been treated that you way. Could. But you're right that yeah. it's yeah. That which is never spoken about. It, it is. Um, I mean, if, if say for example, you you get a um, a couple of parents who who aren't getting on very well and and they're a bit at war with each other, then naturally. Um, you know, it, particularly if it's a family who isn't, like I say, in, into sort of uh, self-analysis, then sides will be taken. Mm. I mean, I, I was working with somebody yesterday where, where this was really very marked in, in his situation that he'd he'd been co-opted, if you like, onto his mother's team, onto his mother's side against his father because as a child it made it easier for him. It reduced his anxiety within the family constellation but mm. it also served a purpose for the mother in terms of her attitude towards his, his father. So he was, as a child, he was weaponised against the father and these things happen all the time. We, we, we see them very commonly, don't we? In, we do. Uh, in our clinical work. Yes, we do. It's the way it works, isn't it? Unfortunately, because um, at a, a social level of the biopsychosocial stack, it's the interaction between separate people uh, and all of their separate perspectives. Um, but when you work clinically with someone, then the focus is usually on the individual, yes. unless there's a dialogue hmm. or there's a family yeah. um, organisation as such. But yeah, yeah. Um, the mother is, though, the prime imprinter under normal circumstances of hmm. the relating function for both sexes. Um, so it's such an important role and if that's wrong for whatever reason it yes. will have its effects but there comes a point where you do have to stop blaming the parents in the sense that you stop blaming the past yeah because you can't change the past but you can alter the future by making changes in the present and the best psychotherapy will focus ultimately on changing the present so you have a better future um, for example, if you, you were unfortunate enough to have parents who abused you and are now deceased, you can't do anything about that, even confronting them is no longer an option. But internally, what they did to you is represented by a whole battery of memories and of emotions, connections. It will affect your self-reference frame, self-esteem, how you behave to others. That's what needs to be dealt with. Um, and there are, there are ways of doing that which mean that you don't have to go careering off into the past and reconstituting the victim ego state, ego mm. state of being a child who was overpowered by a bullying parent. But some therapies do try to do that, and I'm actually against that for all sorts of reasons, which 
I'd be happy to go into in another podcast. Mm. Yeah, well, the, the gentleman I, I mentioned before, um, and, and it follows on from what you're, you're saying, Steve, it was very important for him to... Um, meet his his father now on his own terms as a grown man yeah. with his own relationship and a new relationship his own home um and and so on and to meet him on his own terms now as a grown man as opposed to you know and and he talked about being sort of almost trapped uh, in a room with him when he has any kind of um, social engagement with him as if he were a child again yeah. and, and he or, almost automatically assumes that relationship to him yeah. so I think it was important for him to understand that there was no point mm. in, in going back into the past no. and, and re- no. you know helping to reconstellate yeah. that yeah. now that he has to approach him from, from where he is at now in his yeah. life and that, that, that could actually help to transform his relationship to him if he allowed yeah. it for sure. Well, here's, here's a quick question for you guys then. Um, obviously, you, uh, if, if you, any caregiver you like will transmit um, psychosocially yeah. onto the relating function. Yeah. But uh, would there be any distinct differences if the child was adopted? Um, functionally, at a behavioural, psychosocial level, I would say no. It would be relatively insignificant. Uh, there will be an instinctive understanding at one level if the child is aware that this is not their biological parent there'll be something there that will have an effect it may not have an effect behaviorally but there is nevertheless that there because there's all sorts of ways that people perceive whether someone is related to them or not it can, it can come down to pheromones it can come down to how uh, the, the similarity of psychology or, or patterns of behavior within the wider family interrelate with them that's not to say that um, step parents can't be better parents than biological parents but there is something there and we can't ignore that mm. Mm. yeah about uh, the influence of the mother then as being the primary caregiver for uh, both biological sexes yeah this that is hugely important that uh, we, we can't underestimate the effect particularly if the mother will not later in life let go and allow the child of either sex to flourish with their own identity that's hugely important and it's uh, the source of an awful lot of psychopathology in later life um i don't know the 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 full circumstances of of our friend's uh background at all nothing like it so i can only really talk in general terms but the latency if you like in terms of the effects of a, a damaging relationship to your mother uh, in, in forming a complex which you could broadly call the mother but sits within the relating function and therefore the anima will itself uh, colour everything and that could go from that point onwards down several generations itself so consciousness of that is hugely important but sometimes when dealing with your father then you have to understand your father's anima and even the animus of your father's mother it does get tricky as I mentioned yes. earlier and that's the value of looking back and, and looking at the wider context for influence. But also your mother and father is a system themselves. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And how they then projected yes. a, um, and related to one another. Yeah. So this is one reason why I prefer to use the term relating function. It cuts down a lot of the confusion that would otherwise arise by talking about the contrasexual Jungian archetype or complex in any individual. How does that work? Well, it works through relating, relating internally and externally. Externally at a two-person dyad level and then wider. Also to the times in which you yourself live and flourish, what you allow yourself to be influenced by, uh, how your morals and your ethics, your values express themselves. This is all for your relating function. Therefore, your anima or your animus. So to become conscious properly, you need to understand your relating function. I've said this before that you don't have to go through your shadow first. You don't have to. Uh, I honestly think that's a mistake because the shadow takes longer to become apparent to someone than interacting does. We start to learn about our shadow when we try to relate to others. So there's a paradox there that the relating function, if you're a man, therefore, in Jungian terms, your anima leads you to an awareness of your shadow. It's not the other way around. You only realise you've got one, a shadow, when you start to hurt other people and they get annoyed with you or you come up with 
limitations within the environment or you upset yourself on the inside with respect to how your genomic potential, you could call that your Jungian self archetype if you wish, tries to express itself on that time release that occurs with normal biological maturation. If you then disrupt that, then you discover that you have a shadow all of a sudden. But guess what? You've been relating badly. That's why you create the shadow in the way that you and other people mm. experience it. So understanding the relating function and therefore the anima should come first, not the shadow. The shadow is a moral problem. The anima or the animus is a relating, adapting issue. And we're presented with that immediately that we're born because it's about survival. So very, very important in practical young to live by terms rather than theorise by that you get to grips with your relating function first. So a real quick sort of hint for the guys watching then, they're like, you know, we've got a thing, a question comes up all the time, what is relating, what does it mean? Or as you hinted there, it's interacting with other people. Yeah. So could you take a look, say, and be like, okay, this is my mum, this is my dad. Yeah. These are the way they related to each other, these mm -hmm. are the way they related to me. Yeah. That's probably very similar to my current anima or animus. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah yes. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, I, I'm scanning now as you as you say those words. I, I'm, I had the, the impression of the energy between my parents, but it was mm. more than that. It was also where they lived, uh, and it was the background, because we don't abstract people out of the environment, and that's the the physical environment, but it's also the cultural environment, the times of in which they lived. I have a very clear memory, for example, of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Uh, and of uh, my father talking to my mum about the possibility that the world was going to end. I mean, you know, this was a very, very hard man, really, psychologically, who'd been through a great deal in his life, uh, and I'd imprinted the stability of the world upon my father, and he was talking in that way, which was unusual, and he was talking about nuclear weapons, and that we were on a countdown of hours to imminent global thermonuclear war. It's good fun to hear when you're however many years old. Uh, I would have been five, nearly six at that time. Yeah, lovely. Um, but I, I'd been conscious because I have an autobiographical memory that went back to the age of nine months. Mm. Uh, and my first memory was actually hitting my dad over the head with a roll of uh, wallpaper. Uh, mm. He was on his knees, busy um, wallpapering, and I picked up a roll and uh, just did a samurai sword on him uh, with, unfortunately, not a sword, but a roll of wallpaper. <laughs> a rather thin roll of wallpaper, that, not the full weighty one, which I probably couldn't have picked up at that age, but I did my best. Nevertheless, that had no effect on him other than it being the trigger for my first autobiographical memory. Well, during that, that time period, he was very influential on me in terms of presenting with stability for the environment and providing controls, boundaries, tolerances of behaviour. So I looked on him in that way. He worked shifts, so he would be coming and going at all hours of the day. He breezed in and breezed out. My mum was a stay-at-home mum in those days, as many were. So she provided the stability internally. So for him to come in and say that the, the world was going to end in a war that went or would have gone beyond anything that was imaginable to his generation who'd gone through the Second World War and his parents' generation had gone through the First World War almost blew my mind. Uh, and I was at school and the teachers at school, uh, albeit I was in very early, early stage, they were all reacting in the same way. They were talking about, you know, do we dive under the tables when the flash of the nuclear explosion goes off? Of course it wouldn't have done any good, we would have just been obliterated. Mm -hmm. That's an example, really, of uh, the ambience of how fathers create tolerances and bandwidths for, for you and how you understand your world. So that was a memory triggered by what James said about relating to one's father, oh. for example. Um, and it went straight to that, the idea of... And is this an archetypal idea of the father being the person who mediates between you and the world? Mm. I wonder also threatens with atomic annihilation. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good, that, isn't it? Bang, gone, poof, gone. Mm. Did they used to tell you in those days to hide in fridges and that? Um, From my far too young. <laughs> well, I can remember air raid siren in practice. Did you remember that, Paul? We yes, to, I do, we actually. We used to, we used yes. to get that. And we yeah, used I used to, to hear it. Yeah, we we, we used school. to have to go under the yeah. tables. Yeah. 
So we'd be yeah. away from the glass windows when the blast came, and of course, <laughs> uh, the, the whole wall would, would have made blocked. a lot of The whole school would have just yeah. blown away. Yeah. But yeah, they used to do that kind of thing. Yeah. I could imagine your mum, though, Steve, thinking about the interaction between them, the two of them as a system, yeah. not being that bothered. She wasn't, no. 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 about impending nuclear <laughs> annihilation? Yes, ab- yes yeah. absolutely. As long as you're back she in had time that, for tea. Yes, yeah. she had that quality to her. She uh, almost as if she probably would have insinuated that somehow your dad was exaggerating things and like, yes. just ignoring. Yeah. It'd be like, just ignore your dad. He's, you know, yeah, he's gone matter. up on one, yeah, or it doesn't yeah. matter. Or it's yeah, not in fact, like, yeah. I, I remember yeah. now, she used to say to me, oh, he was in the Navy. Yes. You see that? He, he was at sea. Uh, I went through the Blitz. Mm. I, thought, I saw buildings blowing up and neighbours being killed. Yes. And I just, just went to work and came home again. And she was like she that. Was she was like She had that mm. capacity to dissociate from... Yeah the immediacy of sheer violence and things, and it yes. just somehow wouldn't matter. But it was a way yeah. of reducing his status as well. It did, yes. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't it, did. it, when you think yeah. about it. And, yeah. and and maybe, given that she had two sons as well, in the yeah. uh, in the eyes of her sons. And yeah. so these things, the, the, that these implied things can cause all manner of difficulty. It's a hallucination. Being... Ghosts <laughs> appear now. A hallucination. It's not there, honestly. James is just <laughs> reacting to something. It was an atomic bomb. <laughs> I think it was... Who would we take it from? Is there anything else to say? Or... Well, that... I'm going to leave that in, James. It's... Uh... <laughs> Perhaps it's my mother's spirit and she's a bit upset, or oh, my dad even, you know. Yeah, You've done that dad. before, haven't you? I called upon the spirit of my dead father. Yeah. Yes, I think it's your dad. Who so are not in heaven. Oh. He's in the room and causing disturbances. But these, these dynamics are important, aren't they? They are. Between your parents, and maybe so that's a place to look, to go to. I think, as James was suggesting, to understand you know, your own complexes. If you actually examine that relationship more. I think you come to a better understanding of things and yeah. uh, the yeah. influences on you. Yeah. I mean, your your mum had a, a great way, like I say, of putting your dad down. I mean, if if we were to turn up, everyone would get tea but him, and he yeah. was like an afterthought. It was like, yeah. Tommy, would you like a cup of tea? Hoping that he'd say no. Everyone else yeah. would already have the tea, <laughs> and just little things. Yeah, These yeah. things go on all the time, and they and, and they appear to be innocuous, but they're not. No. They're not, no. It's all about power and control, it, it isn't is. it? And yeah. That's how it affects yes. you, whether you let that happen. And I guess I felt sorry mm. for him, really, because I could mm. see what was going on, you know. Mm. And that does affect your anima. And it made me not want to have a woman like my mum in that regard, because I could see, well, my dad's just a victim in that regard. Such a shame, but there you go. Yeah. Thank you for watching this episode of Young to Live By. If you haven't already, make sure you download our free PDF for integrating your shadow. It includes the most advanced theory on the topic available anywhere on the internet, as well as a full practical breakdown. If you've ever wanted to integrate your shadow, this is honestly the way to do it. Thanks again for watching and take care.